Our keynote speaker in this opening session is Dr. Ahmed Doberman, Deputy Director General for Research at the International Rice Research Institute. Ahim is a soil scientist and agronomist with more than 25 years experience working in Asia, North America, and Central and Southern Europe. Most of his career focuses on rice research. He is recognized internationally as an authority on science and technology for food security and sustainable management of the world's major cereal cropping systems. Currently, Ahim provides strategic leadership and oversight for Iris seed research and outreach programs on genetic resources, rice breeding, crop management, climate change, socio-economic and policy research, information sharing, and capacity building. Today, Ahim's keynote is on accelerating crop improvement for sustainable development. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Ahim Dover. and I earned the price with this, but I don't think I can do it again. Uh, so, I'd like to talk to you this morning about how people who work in crop genetics, and in particular rice genetics, can probably make even uh, bigger and faster contributions to the new sustainable development agenda that we need to address in the next 15 to 20 years. And the starting point of that is that uh, at the turn of the century, the international community, the governments of this world agreed to tackle eight millennium development goals. And those will run out uh, in about two years at the end of 2015. And you can see them listed on this slide. And even so, progress uh, against these uh, eight goals, and there are many different targets. I think there's about 54 specific targets and then an indicators are being used to measure them. Even though the progress uh, in terms of uh, achieving those uh, has varied quite widely from country to country, I think there's a general recognition that it's good to have such global goals that can then lead to motivate countries donors, individual people to act. Because if you don't have those goals and if you don't have specific targets in mind and also precise measures to report against, you may be not moving in the right direction. So the first goal, Millennium Development Goal 1, eradicating hunger and poverty, is the one where we in Asia in particular have made most progress. And essentially, particularly in Southeast and East Asia, it has been achieved already on an average basis. That doesn't mean that we can stop. It still means that we still have to eradicate extreme hunger and poverty completely. And we have to also achieve it in every country in Africa. But in addition to continuing many of those original goals, we are going to face a whole set of new challenges. And in my opinion, the primary driver for that, in addition to all the drivers that we are aware of, climate change, population growth, food security, the primary driver in the next 15 years is going to be broad material improvement of life. There is now 6 billion people who want to catch up with 1 billion people who have already gotten used to consuming large amounts of goods, resources. So it's estimated that by 2030, there may be as many as uh, 5 billion people who on a daily basis uh, consume goods and services in the range of 10 to $100 per person every day, 5 billion people. And 
That will also mean that to achieve that kind of level of consumption, it is likely that the global economy on an average basis will grow at the rate of 3 to 4 percent each year. It means it will double in size every 18 to 20 years, every generation. So if you compare it to today uh, and look ahead at the year 2050, it is likely that the size of the global economy is more than 300 trillion dollars on an annual basis. Difficult to predict, depends on the number of people and the rate of growth. But that's the kind of challenge uh, that we are facing. And that raises, of course, uh, many questions. Is it actually possible to achieve that level of uh, consumption? What are the new problems that we are creating? Uh, we have already, in many parts of the world, levels of overconsumption that lead to a whole range of new problems. And overweight and obesity is just one set of those that then often also lead to becoming the major source or the major reason for non-communicable diseases as now the primary cause of death in the world. So it's not going to be infectious diseases anymore or hunger. Uh, it's increasingly going to be diseases that have to do with overconsumption or the wrong kind of nutrition, the wrong kind of lifestyle that we are going to face. And you can see the red areas uh, in this uh, map. And the big question for us is, of course, what happens to all the other parts of the world that are on that map at present still light blue or blue? Will they follow the same path as the rich countries have done? Will they make the same mistakes, maybe? And what if uh, every person in India and in China and in the Philippines and in Indonesia aspires to consume the same amount of food and other resources as people in the rich countries already do? Will it be possible to go that direction? And then if that was the case, then obviously we would be consuming natural resources, perhaps at a rate that could lead to exceeding what are at present thought to be planetary boundaries. So the boundaries that uh, we could probably establish in some way to describe what is a safe operating space for humanity on Earth. There's a lot of debate about these boundaries. Uh, are they really realistic? Are they quite empirically defined right now in terms of, for example, nitrogen fluxes or climate change or ocean acidification or biodiversity loss? Yeah or water use, yeah. but the bottom line is that there is a carrying capacity probably on Earth that if we want to have a sustainable development, we should probably not exceed. And you can scale this down to the level of each individual country or even the regions within a country. What is the safe operating space? So these are some of the challenges that we are facing and therefore there is a growing consensus, uh, also growing out of the Rio Plus 20 meeting a few years ago, that the new global sustainable development agenda must have four dimensions. Economic development, countries must be able to develop. People want to proceed in life. They want to economically get stronger. We need to ensure social inclusion. We cannot increase the gap between the rich and the poor further because that will lead to social instability. Environmental sustainability, I think we're all aware of that. And on top of all, and cutting across all of the other three pillars, we must have higher levels of good governance at a global scale, at a regional scale, at a country scale, at a subnational scale. So these are generally sought now to be the primary dimensions of sustainable development. And there is a process now ongoing at various levels globally to define a new set of sustainable development goals uh, which will likely to be approved and adopted by the international community sometime in 2015 before the current Millennium Development Goals run out. This process is led by an open working group of the United Nations and you can see the website listed there and I encourage you to take a look at this. There are other activities, and I've listed a few there, that feed into this process, consultations, 
a high level panel of experts that already submitted the report and the suggestion for 12 uh, sustainable development goals. And lastly, a group that I've been involved with uh, since November last year and where I'm chairing the working group on uh, sustainable agriculture and food systems. Uh, it's called the Sustainable Development Solutions Network or SDSN. It's, it's an initiative for the United Nations, but it's primarily designed to mobilize the science, education and technology and business community to contribute to a new agenda for sustainable development. You can find on the website uh, a report in which we have proposed 10 sustainable development goals and 30 targets as examples and another report in which we have gone uh, into much more detail with regard to future directions for agriculture also some of the specific targets and indicators to use and some of the practical solutions and implementation considerations. The point I want to make is that even scientists like many of you who work sometimes on very specific, very detailed aspects of a particular scientific discipline and genetics uh, is one that is pretty much at the upstream end of science in many cases. Even every scientist working on those things uh, should be aware of what the goals of the future sustainable development agenda are and how your work can contribute to this. Uh, they are meant to motivate people to act. They are meant to also focus governments, donors, individual people on issues of high priority. And that's, I think, where we as scientists have increasingly also a responsibility to speak up and let policymakers and others know what we believe are the right things to do. And that's where increasingly we need to come out of our labs and offices and self-imposed shelves of science. We need to speak to the public, they need to understand what we are doing and why we are doing it. And genetics is one of those subjects where there's a lot of public debate and a lot of uh, public misunderstanding what it actually is. So I encourage you to take a look at this and learn more about this. Now specifically we have proposed, as you can see in our group, 10 sustainable development goals that would cover all of those four dimensions of sustainable development. I'm not going to go through all of them, but the only comment I want to make is that whatever the final list of these goals and targets will be, it is clear already that agriculture, and in the widest sense food systems, will be a central component of the next global sustainable development agenda. That is because food security has risen to prominence again, but it is also because of all of the other multiple dimensions agriculture contributes to. Health, biodiversity, climate change, environment, you see them all listed there. And even economic and social development. So we have an opportunity and we have a great responsibility to do more. So what does it mean for people who work on rice? So I think the first uh, uh, point to make is that uh, the global rice equation, as we like to call it, that ERI, hasn't really changed. You know, we thought 10 years ago that consumption would level off or start slowing down because uh, of shifts in consumer patterns. Uh, but as you can see, uh, it has kicked up again in the last uh, few years. And we're basically on a linear trend that associates consumption directly with the number of people on earth. For every one million person or people, we need to produce about 100 million tons of uh, rough rice or paddy more. And so if by 2050 we have 2, million, uh, 2 billion more people, as it is projected roughly, obviously we'll need uh, 200 million tons of paddy more each year at that stage. Now you could say people will be eating less rice and switch to other foods. Uh, that's what we assumed over many years. The reality is that in the last 20 years per capita rice consumption on a global average scale has not changed at all. It has gone down in some countries but up in others. Where this will go in the next uh, 20 years we don't know. 
but I can assure you that at least for the next 5, 10, probably 15 years won't change much. We also believe that increasingly with economic growth, uh, consumers and those who serve consumers, so the food processors, the retailers, the export uh, industry, will increasingly play a role in driving what kind of food they want and therefore also what kind of rice they want. And sometimes even how they want this food or this rice to be grown. You can see already an increasing diversity of rice in the shelves of supermarkets, not only in Asia, but even in Africa. This picture was taken in the grocery store in Khartoum in Sudan. So that's what I think we have to keep in mind also when we talk about research on genetics and breeding. It will diversify in terms of the demands. It will not just be rice, it will be many different kinds of rice. On the supply side, on the production side, perhaps the biggest, one of the biggest challenges is the rising labor costs. And you can see uh, in India and Bangladesh, and this is an example where you think there is plenty of people looking for work in rural areas. We have seen labor costs uh, in the last uh, 10, 12 years rising by three to 400 percent. So what does that mean for farmers? It means there will be less people, there will be more need to increase farm sizes and mechanize farming. And that raises also the question, what is going to be the future for small rice farmers, like this couple in Jharkhand State in India? Will they have a future? Will they be able to make a decent living from an acre of land, or even if it is two? Or are there other trajectories? Will their children want to have that kind of lifestyle? What is the new business model for small farmers in Asia? And there's a lot of uh, interesting trends emerging already, uh, like this example from South Vietnam, where now new small enterprises, basically new kinds of uh, cooperatives, if you wish, are forming that group farmers into larger production units that then are being serviced directly without many middlemen, directly by a company that not only does the milling and processing of the rice for domestic and export markets, but also provides agronomic services, inputs, financing, and also buys the rice. These kind of business models for small farmers, I believe, will be needed if we also want to take advantage of new technologies in Asia. We cannot get stuck at the level of the very small, poor, resource poor farmer, we have to advance in technology but also in the socio-economic setting and business approach to farming. And then what we have also noticed in recent years is that the rice seed sector is changing uh, with private companies increasingly playing a role not just in terms of producing and selling hybrid seeds but also doing more and more R&D in hybrid breeding and genetics, trade development and some also probably in the future increasingly moving uh, towards even high quality inbred rice varieties as a company product. And on the consumer end, of course, we have an increasing interest of the processing industry. So that has uh, severe implications uh, also for the role of public sector research and breeding. Uh, how are we going to uh, interact with the increasing number of private sector players? Do we see it as a competition or do we see it as an opportunity? I believe it is a huge opportunity because private companies, generally speaking, uh, are very incentivized to bring good products to many farmers, or consumers, if you wish for them, customers. Whereas the public sector often lacks this ability and this incentive mechanism. So we need to find ways to effectively not just support this process, but also fill on our own those niches that are still not going to be covered by the private sector. And I believe the rice market is large enough for everyone. We have a long way to go, but we need to find the right mechanisms for this. And um, I think for us, and the institutions in particular who are involved in rice breeding, the fundamental question becomes, 
how can we do breeding very differently than we used to do. A few months ago, actually a few weeks ago, I visited uh, Jharkhand state in eastern India and I went there because I wanted to see uh, the beginning dissemination of a new trout along variety, Sabagi Dan, which was released uh, there in 2009 and is now spreading and is actually uh, one of the fastest rising rice varieties in all of India. Now, when you look back and trace the history of how we got to that stage, you know, it's very typical for public sector approach. You know, it started out in 1997 with a breeder in Erie, Brigitte Courtois, making a cross between an Erie line and a traditional variety, intending to create a variety for upland rice. And then we had a succession of projects with funds from many, many donors, bits and pieces. We're piecing together a continued research process. Three breeders involved over 12 years, a national partner in India in the Trout Network, until finally after 12 years, we had a variety that was released. 12 years. Now, the release was for rain-fed lowland rice, not the originally intended target, but it turned out to be the right product for that. So, 12 years, and this is a fantastic product, farmers like it, it meets the local demand, also because it's shorter duration, but 12 years is not going to be good enough anymore in the future. We cannot justify that type of approach. We have already examples of how to move faster. So, in the same state, uh, just uh, about a week, two weeks ago, our first molecular breeding product for drought tolerance, IR64 upgraded with two drought QTLs, QTL 2.2 and 4.1 was released. Yeah. And what's interesting is there, there we have a product concept that uh, is slightly different. Yeah. Uh, so we have a high yielding variety that must yield the same under non-stress conditions as the recurrent parent. It must have the same uh, eating quality yeah. and it must have a big yield advantage on the drought. You can see the numbers there. Yeah. But what I find most intriguing is that from the parent to the release of this variety, it took us six years. Yeah. Now, of course, you know that marker assisted back crossing is much faster. The actual breeding, uh, pyramiding of those genes we can now do in less than three years. So, but that's the potential that I believe breeders and people working in genetics need to completely understand and utilize more. How can we accelerate rice breeding and how can we make better products that meet more specifically the needs of specific market segments, also consumer requirements, the needs of specific environments and cropping systems, so the farmer requirements. We cannot hope you have many more mega varieties that fit everybody's needs. We need to be more precise, and we need to be more faster. And that has been the fundamental underlying reason for why uh, we believe that uh, public breeding programs uh, need to be restructured in a similar way that the private sector often already operates. So we need breeding pipelines or variety development pipelines that are driven by clearly defined breeding products and their trade packages that are based on a clear understanding of those demands. And we need then, of course, the trade discovery research uh, cutting across and serving those pipelines in an efficient manner. So at Erie, uh, we have gone in this direction in the last well, maybe one and a half to two years. And uh, here is uh, one example. I just took this picture last week at our main breeding site in, near Bujumbura in Burundi, where we have now a regional breeding hub for Eastern Southern Africa. And you can see uh, on this uh, signboard there, if, I'm not sure how easy it is to read, the product specifications for this particular product, uh, inbred varieties for rain-fed lowland ecosystems in Eastern Southern Africa. They have must have traits, they have range traits, and they have wind traits. And breeders, geneticists involved, physiologists need to be able to spell those out very clearly and precisely 
and the breeding pipelines need to be organized along that line. This is our new breeding structure at Erie. We have uh, seven variety pipelines. You can see them here for irrigated and rainfed ecologies, a regional one for Eastern Africa, a Japonica pipeline for temperate as well as tropical environments. They are driven uh, on top by market research uh, and market segmentation analysis and the rise market information system that we are building. Uh, they are fed and fueled by uh, trade development teams that provide the necessary know-how and gene discovery and actual breeding ready traits for each of these pipelines. And then cutting across, uh, we, we take measures now to accelerate breeding at all stages, to cut the variety development time in half. This is our goal, in half. Nothing shorter than that, or longer than that, if you wish. And move also to multi-environment testing in a much more systematic manner, much faster. So what measures uh, can we take to, from a genetics point of view, genetics research point of view, further enhance progress in these areas? So I want to highlight the three areas, so genomics, phenotyping, and then a little bit on disease deployment of resistance genes. So in the area of uh, genetic resources understanding, we believe that we must move now towards what we may call, or hey, my friend Hey Leon is calling, rapid response genetic resources. On one side, we want to, of course, uh, sequence the genomes of all the accessions we have in our gene banks, but more and more, we also need to move towards creating new breeding-ready populations and the gene pools that we can evaluate for new traits in a rapid response manner to the demands of breeding. Uh, you will probably hear more about this later this week. We have just completed uh, sequencing 3,000 uh, new rice genomes together with uh, BGI and CAS in China. This is uh, the first uh, illustration of how these data look like. You can see how they are nicely clustering into the different subspecies of rice. Uh, this is obviously a massive amount of data that will become publicly available uh, later this year. 300,000 SNPs, 200,000 SNPs on 3,000 new genomes. So many of you will have their hands full doing something useful with this. But we also have, I think, in recent years uh, made a lot of interesting progress uh, in creating new breeding materials. Um, I have shown two examples here, uh, magic populations. We have a whole string of those, and I think you will see those during the field tour at Erie, I hope, or at least get more information on this. Uh, but also uh, NAM populations uh, that were primarily also graded by our colleagues at Seattle Africa Rice. These are great resources carrying many valuable uh, breeding ready traits. And we need real test cases where we can learn how to deploy rapid response genetic resources in the development of actual breeding products. Here's one example. Uh, we know and we have started to work much more on specific products for dry, direct seeded rice as one of the future cropping systems options for rice that we are seeing emerging in many parts of Asia because of the labor shortages and the need to make canals. But we need a different plant type for this and it needs to have some very specific traits that you can list it here. You can see listed here, seven of them. Some of them we understand, many of them we don't.